Hey there. So today we're doing Church, State, and Adoption chapter. Um, Lori Carangelo starts at the top with, There is no God higher than truth by Mahatma Gandhi. Then she goes on to say, Separation of church and state is a basic doctrine of American government. It is also a central issue in adoption because the adoption industry is chiefly driven by Christian adoption agencies. That's very true. And their chief lobbyist, National Council for Adoption, which is NCFA, partly financed with $1 billion from our federal government to promote adoption. In the Old Testament, the phrase, I will blot out their names, is more powerful threat than even physical death. And that is written by Rollo May, M.D. in Man's Search for Himself in 1953. Um, so we're going to be breaking, up, breaking it up by different religions. And we're starting with the Christians. So this is the Christian right, Catholics and adoption. Throughout history, the Catholic Church has been a primary instigator of family separations. The Church had several reasons for casting the unwed mother as a sinner and her child as a quote-unquote bastard child, and for allowing mother and the child to be magically redeemed via lies of secret adoption. Adoption was, and still is, one of the Church's tools for Christianizing the world and increasing its own power and control. The church accomplishes this goal by placing children with Christian adopters who are required to raise the child according to the church's beliefs and by falsifying the child's quote-unquote baptismal birth record to reflect that the, the adopters are the parents at date of birth. In the same way that the state amends, aka falsifies, adoptees' original birth certificates. In the Catholic Church's scheme of Christianize the world, the Church uses it domestic adoption agencies such as Catholic Charities and Catholic Social Services and foreign adoption agencies such as Holt International to go a step further in facilitating family separations. Catholic agencies have frequently claimed living parents were dead or unknown, and that children were orphans who had lo living, caring parents. Mm, that's true. Another example of adoption politics in religion is found in The Bloodline of the Holy Grail, The hin Hidden Lineage of Jesus Revealed by Lawrence Gardner, Royal Histographer, um, and this was from his book in 1997. The, foundation, the very foundation of the Roman Catholic Church had Christendom is based on Jesus Christ being a single celibate Messiah born to a virgin Mary. Gardner uses King James Bible archival manuscripts and other data to prove that Jesus had a brother James. That virgin meant young woman. Semitic. Oh, it was Semitic that Jesus' Eucin parents had two marriage ceremonies. One legitimized his conception that Jesus married and had children, that his lineage can be traced from the house of David through the royal house of Stuart, and that the Catholic Church erased his lineage to advance its political power. In Sophian legends, Jesus and Mary Magdalene had a son, Michael, one who is like unto God, that's what the meaning is, while the explosive fiction novel and movie The Da Vinci Code advanced the story that Jesus' wife was Mary Magdalene and they're, they're having a secret daughter, Sarah, and the secret society that protected her and her descendants from discovery. According to the legend, Sarah bore children of her own, carrying on her father's bloodline. It flowed through generations eventually reaching the French royal family, and from there, the rest of the world. The History Channel's series, Ancient Aliens, combines archaeological findings and ancient alien theory to support that gods coming down from the sky that are mentioned in ancient texts of every major religion were actually extraterrestrial visitors from outer space. 
In an age when TV ads encouraged DNA testing and televised documentaries telling us that Jesus Christ had a secret family and that we all may be descendant from alien genes, does it make sense that adult adoptees are prohibited from law from knowing their own human rights? For real? Why? Jeez, they hate us. Anywho, let's continue reading on. Holt International was notorious for lying not only about the child's orphan status, but also about the child's age. For example, in Korean adoptions, so that the child would be more appealing, aka adoptable to American adoptees, Mirabali, Mirabati of Cathedral City, California, is one of ten thousands of Korean adoptees in the U.S. who have discovered this. Not only is her alleged birth name Mirak An, I don't know if I said that right, a made-up name, and that names such as An and Kim were given to many adoptees, uh, to many Korean adoptees, but also that she is probably a year older than her record indicates that her mother did not abandon her and that her adopters signed a contract agreeing to raise her according to Catholic belief in Jesus Christ. <coughs> so, this is what I learned, um, not related to, well, it's related to what the Korean adoption is, um, but in China, if they, the child is actually in an orphanage, they will give them the, the I think it's the first or the last name of the province that the child is in um to know where they're from but often they do have at least one living parent it's it's quite awful anyway patty lamere wrote amfor that she searched for her two daughters for 40 years eventually finding them with the help of the unsolved mysteries t television show Catholic Charities of Indiana had forced her to sign their death certificates as well as relinquishments for adoption. The phony death certificates enabled Catholic Charities to hide any proper trail so Patty and her daughters could not find each other. Another adoptee wrote AM4, It was a Catholic priest who told my adopter I had bad blood because my mom was a prostitute and I got shoved down I got that shoved down my throat for years because of this priest. When I became an adult, he damned me to hell in front of other people for getting a divorce. And then he died naked in his, in his housekeeper's bed. That was by Jen Goad, um, who wrote in 2000. Wow. Karma? <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to laugh, but he, yikes. On February 3rd, 2002, CBS 60 Minutes re-ran a segment about the church's scheme in regard to the 10,000 migrant children alleged by the church to be orphans and sent from Britain to Australia allegedly to be adopted there. Instead of adoption, the Christian brothers, aka the Australian priests, used the kids as slave laborers to build their mission, part of the scheme to populate most of mostly aboriginal Australia with white Christians. These priests sexually abused the kids. In fact, a fact which was generally known back in England, as was the overall scheme all the way up to the queen. Why am I not surprised? The clincher is, is that the kids were not orphans, but were told their mothers were dead, and their mothers never gave permission for their children to be relinquished for adoption. The mothers were told it was too late to reclaim their kids when they wanted to get them back from foster care and that the children had been adopted in Britain. The mothers were never told that their children had been sent to Australia. Only one in 10,000 were actually adopted. Wow. Margaret Humphreys of the Children Migrant Trust began looking for any mothers who were still alive. Children, oh, sorry, England won't acknowledge or apologize for about what has been done and only recently began to help fund reunions of the adult children with their mothers, most of whom have probably since died or soon will. This is from Empty Cradles, written by Margaret Humphreys. The Dupolisis orphan scandal was called North America's largest case of 
institutionalized abuse by in lawsuit brought by adults who as children in the 1940s and 1960s sorry from the 1940s to 1960s were sexualized abused beaten subjected to horrors such as electroshock therapy and lobotomies by priests and nuns of the Catholic Church of Quebec while in their care the atrocities were hidden by the church who falsely labeled over 5000 children as quote unquote mentally deficient and renamed the orphans as healthcare facilities. Sorry, they renamed the orphanages as healthcare facilities in order to receive fund federal subsidies. Most of the quote unquote orphans had been taken from unwed mothers who had been promised a better life for their children. In 2001, the settlement for the cl claimants received an increased offer from the Quebec government for a flat payment of $10,000 per person, plus an additional $1,000 for each year of wrongful confinement to a mental institution. The offer amounted approximately $25,000 per an orphan. However, it was limited to each of the $1,000 1,100, sorry, of the 3,000 surviving orphans the government labeled as mentally deficient and did not include any compensation for victims sexually or other, for, of sexual or other abuse. Faced with few choices, the offer was accepted while the remainder received nothing. Many believe that the justice was not done and criminal wrongdoing was allowed to go unpunished and the source for that was CBS Archives. One example of discriminatory application of disclosure law is that of Gregory Mox, an adoptee incarcerated in Michigan who applied to Catholic services of Macab Macab Macomb, Michigan, sorry, for disclosure in, in closing the required $60 fee donated by AM4 for his non-identifying social and medical background information from his adoption file to which he is entitled under Michigan statute. Joanne Ailes returned Am Forrest's check and repeatedly refused to provide Greg any information, nor did she even respond to him directly within 63 days of his request as Michigan law requisites. Nor since, but Catholic Services of Wayne County Michigan readily provided extensive non-identifying information to Brian Andrew Haar, also an incarcerated Michigan adoptee, and even waived the $60 fee due to his indigent prisoner status. The clincher here is that both of these adoptions were convicted at the, sorry, both of these adoptees were convicted at the same time For, of the same crime of murder. Wait, what? I always expressed her bias against prisoners in general to this writer. Greg's and Brian's Catholic social service adoptions were said to be largely responsible for their behaviors that led to the murders. Michigan law also permits all adoptees, including incarcerated adoptees, to be registered on the Michigan State Mutual Consent Registry to have... Wait, what? To have a court appointed confidential intermediary search and for and contact with the adoptee's mother. Sister Ailes insisted on being intermediary for a two hundred dollar fifty fee, a conflict of interest considering she had already refused him and could retain two hundred and fifty dollars without provision of any information to Greg. Oh man. What they do to these people, I swear to God, I'm not happy. Um, all right. She then quotes Reverend Ruth Peterson. Adoption is a form of domestic terrorism. Yep. All right. Protestants and adoption. In 1981, the 
Presbyterian General Assembly in Houston, Texas, unanimously passed their open records policy in Overture, in Overture 39, supporting legislation regarding the right of adult adoptees and their national natural parents from the Presbytery of Newton at Madison, New Jersey in 81, which speaks of Moses, the first adoptee, God, and sealed record laws. Lutherans, on the other hand, were not so liberal. Richard and Carol Kruger filed a $2.6 million lawsuit against the Lutheran Social Services and Illinois Department of Children and Family Services, DCFS, alleging the agencies deceived them about the, the physical and mental health of their adopted son, Rick, and his biological parents, which was posted in Wrongful Adoption, uh, ABA Journal in April of 19, in 1990. The Southern Baptist Convention in 2010 announced a new adoption fund which subsidizes the cost of Bethany Christian Service Pastors by $2,000, um, and this was posted in PR Newswire uh, 2010. While Bethany Christian Services reported a 26% increase in adoptions they they facilitated in 2010, in addition to taking the to the taking of Haitian children for the adoption in the U.S. During the 2010 Haiti earthquake devastation, Bethany attributes the increase in adoption to new movements within Christian churches, which are creating attitudes for young couples. Bethany has been getting more families to adopt by partnering with organizations such as Catalyst, Saddleback Church, Hugh Conference, Southern Baptist Denomination, and Christians Alliance for Orphans and obtaining grants to increase adoption from Wendy's Dave Thomas Adoption Foundation. Um, so just a little background on Bethany um, Christian Services. Recently, and I mean like within the last week, they, or well, from the time that I post this, within the last month or two, they have actually no longer have their license for international adoptions, which is good because they do horrible things. They don't tell the truth. They are a horrible, horrible, horrible agency. I'm telling you, these agencies just want to make money. They make $14.1 billion in profit off of adoptions. Okay. Anyway, everyone on this planet is separated by only six people. But how to find the right six people? John Guare, Six Degrees of Separation. I don't know if you guys ever heard of that. There's always a six degrees of separation from someone. It's quite interesting. Anyway, Mormons in adoption. The Mormon Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints said, regards accurate documentation of one's genealogy to be an essential requirement of the religion. The church has the largest collections of vital re records information worldwide. Yet the Mormon Church has encouraged adopters to quote-unquote, seal the adoptee to the genealogy of the adopter, denying them a knowledge of true heritage because the Mormon stronghold of Utah also falsifies its adoptee's birth records according to Utah state law. Naming the adoptee, the adopters as the parents on the date of birth and will not per permit any adult adoptee automatic access to his or her true birth record. That actually happens in most states. Um, that's not just a Utah thing. In all states, and in fact, in I think all countries, that is what happens. I don't know of any country that doesn't do that. Which is so wrong. Very, 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 very wrong. Anyway, continuing on. The official website of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints at LDS.org states, Placing an infant for adoption through LDS Family Services helps unwed parents do what is best for the child. It ensures that the child will be sealed to a mother and father in the temple and enhances the prospect 
for the blessings of the gospel in the lives of all concerned. So the Mormons, the, the LDS, is a cult. Um, and there are a lot of people coming out of it, especially as birth parents. And they are talking on it. Like, you guys can find a mass amount on TikTok. And they are telling um, their stories and how harmful they are to people. through Especially through adoption. Um, and how they treat how they treat kids but especially the first parents the first mothers specifically in another four generations or so absolutely sorry in another four generations or so absolute half the ancestry of the american population will be bogus that was by attorney bryce m cleggett uh, who lived from 1933 to 2008, and he was quoted in Nexus, New England Historical Genealogy Society newsletter um, in February of 1990. Claggett describes how genealogical research, whether for medical purposes, sociological studies, or hobby purposes, is becoming increasingly impaired with each passing generation by secrecy laws. The bogus record names the adopters as the parents from date of birth does not reveal in any way that they are not the birth parents. Thus, the researcher has no way of knowing that the apparent ancestry of the child, as shown in public records, is bogus. Utah also limits time for a single father to assert his parental rights to 20 days. And has come under fire to due to adoption agencies sending single mothers from other states to Utah for relinquishment and adoption of babies with the intent to prevent fathers from asserting parental rights for claim of custody and consenting a relinquishment timely. Yeah. All right. We're going to move on to a different religion now. If he knows the why of his, for his existence, he will be able to bear almost any how. Victor Frankl. So now we're going to be talking about the Jews, Judaism, and um, adoption. There is no equivalent in Jewish, sorry, in Jewish law to civil adoption, which requires that adopters to assume all rights and responsibilities towards the child becoming the legal parents in every way. In fact, there is no word in classical Hebrew that means adoption. In modern Israel, the word ametz is used to reference a branch transplanted to another tree. And this is from Palms 80, 1560. Am4 completed family searches for adoptees raised as Catholics who discovered their biological parents as Jewish as well as adoptees raised as Jews who discovered their biological parents are Catholic. Complexities of Jewish tradition raise many issues for, those, for these adoptees. Adoption in Jewish life is older than the Bible. Moses was the first adoptee raised by Pharaoh's wife and later returned to the, his people. Um, also, Abraham, unable to have a child of his own, adopted his servant Eliza as his heir, and Jacob adopted two of his grandsons as his sons. Esther was raised by cousins Merkadi. The classical Jewish statement regarding adoption refers to Maka, Mak, Michael, the wife of King David. Maka, I don't know if I said that right. Merib bore them and Michael brought them up. Therefore, they are called by her name. This teaches that whoever brings up an, an orphan in their home, script, scripture ascribes it to him as though he had been, he had begotten him. Sanhedrin 19b. This may be where as born to myth originated and which adoption bonkers and agencies, sorry, <laughs> bonkers, adoption brokers and agencies have been since used as a marketing tool. Adoption does not change a child's status in Jewish law. 
Unlike civil law, Jewish law places great importance on bloodlines and lineage. Even if a child is adopted in the civil courts, the child maintains his or her biological identity, meaning if a Gentile child is adopted into a Jewish home, the child remains Gentile. To be considered Jewish, the child must go through a formal conversion. If the male adopter is a Cohen or a Levi, this status is not passed on to the adopted child. Conversely, a Jewish baby whose biological father is a Cohen, theoretically, that child, even when adopted, will always remain a Cohen. If the baby is the firstborn of a Jewish mother, they require a Pididian heaven, a ritual of redemption of the firstborn, even if the adopters have other children. However, with rare exceptions, all legal adoptions must be finalized according to state adoption confidentiality laws, and most civil adoptions for the past six decades have been sealed records adoptions, prohibiting naming the natural parents and requiring that the child's surname be changed to their adopter's surname on the amended birth certificate as of the date of birth. The Jewish community is deeply divided on conversion policies for adopted children. Jewish law will differ depending on whether the mother is Jewish or Gentile. All conservative and orthodox rabbis require the formal conversion of a child born to a Gentile mother. Many for reform rabbis dispense with this ritual, teaching that it is sufficient supply to give the child a Hebrew name. However, such a child named in a reform Temple may have difficulties later in life if they choose to affiliate with a more traditional synagogue or marry a conservative. Despite that Hitler's quote-unquote master race plan resulted in mass extermination of Jews, today infertile Jewish couples desperate for a child evidently don't view adoption, which exterminates the child's true heritage to a form of genocide. The midrash teaches, sorry, the midrash teaches, the one who brings up a child is called its parent, not the one who gave birth. Source Exodus Rabbi, Rabbah, forty six five. But that does not bestow entitlement to another child simply because a prospective adopter may be better able to provide for the child. Ooh, I hate that wording. Okay, sorry. Hold on a second. So entitlement is in quotes, and I'm going to just say this. If you guys have been reading with me The Primal Wound, nobody is entitled to someone else's child. And just because you think you can better provide for a child, whether it be money or opportunities, does not make you a better parent. And this is why often adoptions happen is 95% of the case, the birth mothers are convinced of this that they won't be able to take care of the child when they're just not given the resources for it. And infertile couples specifically, not saying that goes for any um, race, religion, status, you know, they're not entitled to a child. They're just not. There are other options. I'm not saying they're all the best or inexpensive, but that does not mean you're going to be a better parent. And they're focusing on the parent point of view rather than what's in the best interest for the child and that is problematic okay anywho let's move on in the 1950s and 1960s jews could not adopt through predominantly christian adoption agencies of course not like they still can't so uh, all right anyway in desperation those who could afford black market adoption bought their children yeah it still happens today Adoptee Bill Burl explains that his adopter, famed comedian Milton Burl, through his celebrity status, found black market channels for procuring the newborn boy of his, for his wife Ruth. My father, Uncle Mitty, by Uncle Burl. Okay, I'm going to pause there for a second as well. It's always for the wife. It's always because it's the wife's idea. Always. Always. Okay, moving on. Yvette Silverman Mel Melanson, stolen along with a 
her twin brother from a Navajo family 43 years prior, was raised rich, white, and Jewish in Brooklyn. Ooh, what, what, a, what a time. Reunion Day at 43, Navajo native finally home, posted in the Boston Globe in 96. Statistics are hard to come by, but it appears that adoption among Jews is on the rise, mainly because Jews often postpone childbearing until later years, and then the women find she is infertile. According to the 1990 National Jewish Population Survey by the Council of Jewish Federations, 3% of all Jews in America, or 246,000, or 8,200,000 Jews were adopted. I'm so confused, but okay. There are about, oh, sorry, 246,000 of 8, 82 million, no, 8 million 200,000 Jews. Sorry, that that's the 3%. Whew, that's a handful. There were about 60,000 adopted children under the age of 18 in the total Jewish population. Desperation of infertile Jewish couples amounts to 25% of the adopted children who came from overseas. The Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Adoption Loan Program of the Hebrew, Loan, Hebrew Free Loan Society, HFLS, assists Jewish couples and singles with the high cost of adoption-related expenses. It is a unique financial resource for those who have su sufficient income to support a child but are unable to afford the adoption expenses. HFLS also provides loan assistance to single parent families, a population with high levels of need and large families of the modest means. David and Michelle Slotnick desperately wanted a child. After year, five years of trying to conceive, the couple was anxious to begin the adoption process. They had spent most of their 25000 in earnings on fertility treatments and they could not afford the 20000 to 30000 in fees that associated with adoption. HFLS provided loans to Slotnik, who then adopted two children. See, this is disgusting to me. They're still equating a child to amount of money, not thinking that what's in the best interest for the child is to stay with the family when possible. I am grossed out. Now, there are Jewish foster care agencies as well, um, I don't know all that much about them. My mom was kind of telling me about them because she worked for one back in the 90s. Um, but it just grosses me out. They're still not thinking about the child first. On top of that, there's a lot of religious trauma. I know we talk mostly about it with the Christian, the Christianity side. But let's be real. It does happen in all religions. And it's not okay. All right, moving on. I and this person who looks after an orphan will be in paradise together like this. Then he raised his forefinger and middle finger together. This was Mohammed, who um, was an orphan himself. Muslims and adoption. In Islam, the central no notion of justice in the sh shara, sh sharia, I don't know if I said that right, is based on mutual respect of one human being by another. The just society in Islam means the society that secures and maintains respect for persons and their rights through various social arrangements that are in the common interest and welfare of all members. Islam views adoption as a falsification of the natural order of society and of reality. And the prohibition of legal adoption in Islam has been, in fact, ordained to protect the rights not of a single class, but of the adopted, adopter, natural parents, or other individuals affected by adoption. In society as a whole, the child is an extension of their father and the bearer of their characteristics. During their lifetime, they are the joy of their father's eyes, while after their father's death, a child represents a continuation of their existence, an embodiment of their immortality. The child inherits their features and stature as well as their mental qualities and traits, both the good and the bad, the beautiful as well as the ugly. The child is part of the father's heart and a piece of, their, of his body. These facts cannot be altered by adoption of that child by anyone, and Islam has provided the inal inalienable right 
of the child to the lineage, lineage well as that the natural father to lineage. The child in Islam also has an equally inalienable right to legitimacy. The principle of legitimacy holds that every child shall have a father and one father only. This is why Allah has ordained marriage and has forbidden adultery, so that paternity may be established without doubt or ambiguity ambiguity and that the child may be referred to their father and the father of their sons and daughters hence adoption cannot be used in islam to hide illegitimacy of or or the paternity of the child by adopting someone else's child as one's own the rightful and deserving heirs to the property of a man are deprived of their shares hence islam made it harem a.k.a. forbidden, for a father to deprive his natural children of inheritance. Allah has established the distribution of inheritance in order to give such eligible persons his or her share. In matter of inheritance, the Quran does not recognize any claim except those based on relationship through blood and marriage. Quran 875 Taking a stranger by adoption into the family as one of its members and allowing them the privacy to be with women who are not close relatives, non marum, is a deception. Also, when the adopted child lin- lineal identity or paternity is changed, the adopted child may unknowingly enter into incestuous relationships by marrying close relatives of the natural parents, ma- maharum, or otherwise his ma- ma- Mar- marital chances may be genu- in general become subject to confusion. It is not conductive to family solidarity and overall harmony and peace, which is necessary for social stability. However, adoption is also used in another sense. This use of adoption is not prohibited by Islam. That is, when a man brings home an orphan, including a foundling or abandoned child, and wants to raise, to educate, and to treat as his own child. In this case, he protects, feeds, clothes, and loves the child as his own without attributing the child to himself, nor does he give him or her the rights which the Sharia reserves for natural child. If a man is childless childless and has no children of their own, and he wishes to benefit such a child, orphan, or foundling, from his wealth, he may give him whatever he wants during his lifetime. This is meritorious and noteworthy act in Islam, and the man who does it will be rewarded by Allah. So this is according to the adoption laws in Islam, some issues by Zah- Zadul Islam uh, Biswas, an advocate of the Supreme Court in Bangladesh and specializing in the rural Justice and Family Law. The article was first published in Law and Our Rights of the Daily Star in 2005 in Bangladesh. Whew, there is a lot to say there. Okay, so basically, in America, the way that the civil law, so basically the legal portion of adoption, is not allowed in the Islam religion, right? Because by legal standards here in America, they and, and most places they change the original records they change it so that it is the adoptive parents on the birth certificate which as adoptees we think it's completely wrong to do fyi but what they're saying is that you're not going to hide any of that information so while islam doesn't negate adoption shouldn't be happening they're not keeping that child from inheritance, they're not keeping that child from their heritage and from their from their natural their their heritage or their biological family. What they're saying is we're not going to change any of that by hiding it, which is what Americans do. Um, and so I think that's really important to note is that the way that Islamic countries handle adoption is not really adoption in the sense that it is here um it's very much i'll take you in i'll feed you i'll clothe you but you don't you don't um have to be grateful for any of that 
That is because I chose to help you in that circumstance. And it's about you, not about me as the parent. Um, and that's really, really important to note. Not a lot of people understand that. Okay. And a final note about religion and adoption. While child molesting Catholic priest scandals continue to make headlines and these predators reside on, at all levels of the church hierarchy, sexual molestation of adopted children is not limited to any one religious group, as revealed at Reformation.com. A 62-year-old Ocula former Florida pastor whose name has been withheld in consideration of his two adopted daughters, who he molested, was convicted of nine sex-related charges. The younger adopted daughter at age 11 was forced to have sex with her adopter in his study where he wrote his sermons. And the man is father to his older adopted daughter's son. So he adopted the grandchild. And that was a according to the Associated Press in 2001.